Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've been looking at lots of issues since the pandemic stuck, struck, uh, but the future of the City of London is absolutely core to what we at the CSFI do. And I'm delighted that we've been able to put together a series with Barney Reynolds, Barnabas Reynolds. Barney is the Global Head of Financial Services and a member of the Executive Committee at Sherman and Sterling here in London. And he has uh, a reputation, as it were, uh, for looking on the sunnier side of some of the issues that are facing the city. But he doesn't get things all his own way. This month, we have two other panelists, Kirstina Kuhn, who is the Managing Director and uh, Global and Group Head of Regulation and Compliance at the London Metal Exchange, where she's responsible for uh, compliance at both the LME and at LME Clear. She's uh, been there for what, I don't know, previously joined, previously she spent seven years at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and before that at Bank of America itself, educated in South Africa, but she's been a fixture in the city for a long time. And John Godfrey, who is the, uh, well, what is he now? He is the Corporate Affairs Director at Legal and General here. Uh, he originally joined Legal and General in, what, in uh, sometime, I think in 2006, uh, was previously responsible for corporate communications and then took a year off as uh, uh, advisor to Mrs. May, uh, 10 Downing Street, returned to Legal and General in 2017 as Corporate Affairs Director. So that's the, uh, that's the group. I'm going to ask Kirstina and John both just to say a few words about what they're up to. I think, the, the as you will have seen, the LME came back uh, to the city in, with, its, with its open open outcry ring yesterday. Uh, John, I don't know what John's up to at Legal and General, but Legal and General is obviously a major player in Europe, European financial services. But first of all, Christina, what's, uh, what's happening at the LME? Well, I mean, as you say, you know, things have been somewhat different for the last 18 months. You know, the pandemic meant that um, the 140-year um, uh, ring um, or the open outcry um, had to go electronic, um, and after 18 months, it went back yesterday. Um, there have been some changes in terms of how we manage that and, and what is actually conducted, what business is actually conducted on the ring um, as a result of um, the discussion paper that we released and the feedback we received from the market in terms of should it come back at all, should it come back in part, all of that is, has sort of culminated in, in yesterday's uh, return to the ring session, uh, which uh, seemed to go without, without, um, without incident, which is what we're looking for. Um, and, and we will see how we get on uh, from here. I mean, I think there, was, there were a lot of people who were surprised that we came back at all. Um, but at the end of the day, this is, uh, you know, this is as a result of, of, of taking on, bar, on board market feedback. And um, we, will, we will see where we go from here. Hmm. Is, there, is there an argument that one can make uh, for the, the social, if you like, the social context of, a, of an open outcry system being in some sense uh, better than, uh, than a straight electronic trading system? I mean, are you, uh, are, you, are you comfortable that the open outcry system can prevail longer term or is this, um, is this something that you'll have to rethink? I think this will be under constant review. There are so many different uh, perspectives on it in its totality. Um, some would argue that, you know, having the human element does allow you to adapt um, how you're actually uh, managing the trades that you're, uh, that you're overseeing in a much more sort of uh, fluid way than you would if it was set by VWAP. Others would argue that a VWAP is a much more appropriate way to be setting the prices um, or discovering those. Um, and I think it's, it really is something that we have to we have to constantly review. We're always conscious of it. It is one out of three platforms that 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 we you know there's always the phone, there's the electronic, and there's the ring. So it's sort of as a as a as a cumulative option, it makes sense, and it will it, you know we will we will keep it under review because when it ceases to to make sense for the market, then it ceases to make sense for the market. John, what are you up to at LNG? Well, I think uh, I think we're probably, generally speaking, far too introverted to thrive in an open outcry market. Um, uh, LNG these days uh, obviously has a history as, as a as life insurance and pensions provider. We still do those things, but uh, the bigger part of our business, uh, in many ways, now is 
as an investment manager, where we're looking after about 1.3 trillion pounds worth uh, of assets under management. Um, what is interesting, I think, at the moment is a, an increasing focus on productive finance and real assets. And this is a commercial imperative driven by low interest rates and the sheer volume of money that is uh, available in the world today. Um, but it's also something that ties together a social uh, purpose as well. So we like to invest where we can succeed commercially and deliver a positive social outcome. Usually that involves doing things like investing in urban regeneration, housing, new cities, supporting uh, scale up and growth industries. So it's very different from the sort of historical way that major UK investment managers and indeed insurance companies, institutions used to work. Uh, which I think is positive. It goes under the name of inclusive capitalism or productive finance, depending on your choice of uh, terminology. Okay, let's move to back to Bern, uh, to Barney and to, to to what's up in the uh, in the wider world. And how do we keep the city in the forefront of international financial centres? Barney Reynolds. Well, um, it's certainly a topic. Uh, the FT wrote recently, quoting City UK about how. Um, UK it was losing business uh, post Brexit to um, New York, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on. Um, and we need to sharpen up. In particular, they, they mentioned tax and labour laws. Um, my view is we certainly do need to take some urgent steps. I think we were losing competitiveness before Brexit. I don't see this as being a Brexit-related point, vis-a-vis um, -vis New York in particular. Um, because I think of our style of regulation, tax is relevant, labour laws certainly making this more flexible for the professionals that operate in the city would be, I think, very beneficial. Uh, and we can do that now. Um, and, uh, but on, on regulation, um, this is a big topic for discussion. Uh, the Treasury are looking at um, uh, and they're consulting on a number of sort of micro changes and more macro changes that we talked about last time around to things like MIFID II and Solvency II. Uh, a lot of that sort of fine needlework uh, rather than a prof you know, a profound change. I think we do need to look more profoundly. And I think we need to look at legal and regulatory method um, because uh, all the evidence shows that um, that leads to greater economic growth. And we're sitting on, in a way, our killer app, which is the common law legal method, which is pragmatic and precedent based rather than top down controlling. And so, so are the other financial centers I mentioned. Uh, but we are, we've traditionally been better at it. And the Treasury, I mean, I wrote a book in February about this called Restoring UK Law. Um, the thesis of the common law was adopted in the Tigger Report of June this year, and it's now been consulted upon, uh, in fact, by Bayes and the, and the Cabinet Office um, uh, on, uh, in a consultation entitled Reforming the Framework for Better Regulation, which they're looking across. This is October, came out in October. Uh, they're looking across... Um, all sectors, not just financial services. Uh, and so it, in a way, they're jumbling up two different things. One is where you have an independent regulator like financial services, where it seems to me the government can't be involved in overseeing the regulator, otherwise you undermine the independence. And sort of quangos and sort of quasi-regulators, which are really just outsourced uh, arms of government, which can be overseen by government. But I, my concern with the general, I think a lot of the thrust is correct. I think we do need to readopt the common law method, which is fewer rules, better drafted. Uh, but we need to look at least impact intervention. Uh, they use the word proportionality, which is an EU concept. I think I think uh, the common law method I would characterize as least impact intervention. Uh, but then you and then the, the, the biggest thing I think that still needs thinking through, and I shall be writing about this, is um, the fact that they're trying to put a weight on the government overseeing the regulators, applying economic theory to see what the cost benefit is of regulation, uh, impact is of regulations and whether the regulation is efficient. Whereas I don't think economic theory is sufficiently nuanced and sophisticated to be able to address whether something has been drafted well or is being interpreted and applied in a sufficiently predictable and consistent manner. So I, I think really the old fashioned separation of powers doctrine with the courts and parliament overseeing, a parliament overseeing its delegate and the courts uh, providing a check and balance where you can air points through open court argumentation and real evidence being produced. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a shortcut. And I know people are always looking for shortcuts around those two things, but I think it would be a mistake. Can I bring Christina and, um... John in on this, because actually both of you have a legal background. 
Um, just to, do, do, you, do you share Barney's view that you know the best thing that the city has going for it is ultimately the common common law tradition that we better damn well get it right because if we're losing business, we're losing to to other centres that are based on common law and maybe doing it better than we are. Uh, Christina first. I mean, I, I do agree that our sort of let's say our legal system is a huge. Uh, Feather in our cap. I mean, if not one of the ultimate ones, along with time zones and 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 sort of, I suppose, general uh, technical capabilities. I mean, in terms of the proposals with regards to how are we going to oversee the regulate the, the, the financial services market in a post Brexit world. Um, I mean, we are very supportive of the proposals that were contained in the wholesale markets review, um, in the regulatory framework review. Um, I think this concept of putting the big ticket items, or let's call it level one, as we used to refer to it in, in EU speak, in the hands of the policymakers or the rule makers makes sense. Keep the big stuff high level and take the small stuff and put that in the hands of what we would call the experts, your regulators, your actual, you know, your FCA, your Bank of England, your PRA. I'm sure everybody has opinions on what constitutes an expert, but for us, those are the individuals or those are the institutions with the requisite knowledge to, to look at the more granular details pertaining to the regulatory framework. Um, I mean, that would be that would be my initial perspectives on this, but I don't know, you know. John. Yeah, um, I think Barney makes a good point. Uh, actually, and uh, if you travel around the world, I mean, for example, to China, you will hear probably anecdotally people saying one of the reasons they still hold the UK in, in good regard is that the UK has historically been very good at making up rules for things. And that uh, sort of varies from, you know, the laws of the, sh of the sea and shipping uh, through to the laws of uh, most games and sports. Uh, and so on. And if you think back to the times when the, the city has been really innovative, you know, for example, the explosive growth of the Eurobond market, the swaps market, uh, all of those kind of things back when, when I was a young banker uh, and, and since, those things have existed comfortably within a framework of, of, of English law. And that is a very positive thing in, indeed to have. I, I do agree also that... Um, where we go from here is really important because in a post-Brexit world, we have incorporated the whole corpus of EU legislation. Uh, it is sat here in the process probably of being delegated back out to our regulators as part of the FISMA framework. And we need to be quite careful how that lands and what powers are retained by Parliament to set direction because it's certainly been pre-Brexit uh, one of the concerns of many parts of the financial services industry that the problem is not so much what was in European law, but how those European laws and regulations were applied by local regulators. That, for example, in Solvency 2 was one of the great challenges rather than the drafting itself, where we had ironically played into our historic strength and been quite influential uh, uh, in, in Europe at making sure laws were, were framed uh, in a way that was helpful to markets. Well, let me come back to you, Barney, because um, you, I mean, when you say how important the drafting is and we've got to get the drafting right, are you concerned that we're going to get it wrong? I'm not sure yet whether there's a full appreciation of the level of um, shift required. Um, I mean, the old style of regulation involved the Bank of England with governor's eyebrows, the banking, insurance was very much like touch in the DTI and so on. Um, and businesses failed, but they failed safely by and large. Um, that, that doesn't work in the modern world. It needs to be more rules-based. But the rules-based method, going back to the point John raised, which I think is exactly right, uh, is very different here from in the EU. So Solvency 2 was based on UK science, but because of German issues about delegating so much power to, that we'd be comfortable with to the regulators, it was put in level one text, which is inflexible. And then it, the harmonized interpretation of that text orchestrated by EOPA uh, and the way that EU law is purposive, looking at the purposes of the EU project you know, in, in, in evaluating and understanding it, is completely different from our system, which is largely literal in terms of drafting clear rules that you then read and a lay person can interpret. And if you go to a purpose, it's very, very, uh, occasionally look at what Parliament meant, uh, but but that's a very, very occasional thing. So there's a fundamental rethink of method, and there's a whole blanket of rule that 
making a new EU code that's unnecessary to our system, uh, that's to do with putting things into boxes, which we need to remove. And that's a big lift. And, then, and it comes from the Napoleonic um, German methods of lawmaking developed in the 19th century, where they attempted to put life into, uh, apply science, scientific principles to the law, which, which has failed as a method. Uh, and it doesn't work for sophisticated, dynamic businesses like financial services. Right. So just fill in what's what's the time frame of the reforms that are, are, are being considered by the government at the present time so that we know what we should be more worried about. Well, it's about. iterative. I mean, this paper on, on um, uh, the, the consultation from the government on reforming the regulatory framework, which does not grapple which, with, I, with, I think, the two most fundamental things that are going to keep it on the right straight and narrow, which is the role of parliament in the courts. It seeks to have government overseeing the regulators. I think they feel burnt by the courts and burnt by parliament. I understand all of that, but using economic models, which I don't think are up to the task. Uh, that uh, just literally come out. I mean, later this year, they're obviously making some choices. The Treasury, I think, have a, you know, are working on a statute, I believe, coming out early next year uh, to make some of the micro uh, and some more macro changes, including solvency too, uh, that have been consulted on. I think it's more fundamental. And I don't, I don't see a discussion of that in Parliament or elsewhere of a sufficiently fundamental nature uh, to achieve the gains that I think are there for free. I mean, you know, tax is, is not a free thing to start tinkering around with, particularly in the current climate. Labour laws we could change for high-end professionals who I don't ex think expect some of the protections that are baked in. I think we should look at doing that. Data protection is a damp in the wrong business, very significant. I think we should look at the method around that, look at you know having people owning their own data and being able to tell people how to use it rather than all the GDPR stuff. But the one that's free, the completely free, uh, is financial, the re regulatory method. I mean, it's just a, a statutory change and a, a thinking change. And if we get that right, all the economic evidence shows from La Corsa onwards in 1989 and the Met America, a lot of effort into this, how much growth you get out of using these superior methods. I think the Industrial Revolution uh, owed a lot to that. I think the growth of Lloyds of London and some of the examples John mentioned owed, to that, owed a lot to that. John, you uh, spent a couple of years in Downing Street. Um, what kind of response does... Uh... How do you expect these sorts of more radical uh, suggestions will get politically? Um, well, I think there are two, two main issues around financial regulation and how it works right at the top of, of UK politics. I mean, the first one is that uh, it is a topic that has very little political upside. And you saw this, for example, around Brexit and you know, the thing which financial services professionals always find hard to, to believe and to accept is that uh, you know, fishing, for example, which is in GDP terms, a tiny industry compared with finance, uh, receives a huge amount more focus and attention because it's more politically salient. The, the second point, uh, I think, is that uh, it is complex and it's very technical and therefore it, it assumes a sort of second order of political importance. So it's hard to get politicians to really focus uh, on this, especially when they start quite often from a position of risk aversion. And when you think about regulatory issues, a politician generally, or government a minister will be much more worried about anything going wrong than 99 other things going stunningly right. And that's a hurdle you always have to, to overcome you know, well, is that something that, uh, I mean, you know, the danger of, of radical reform is that radical reform does, you know, have uh, unintended consequences and you may, you know, the, the, the line of least resistance may be just to make little tweaks. Uh, do we actually need radical reform? I mean, Kirstina? I mean, you know, it's a really interesting uh, sort of conundrum in some respects because any of us who've spent... You know, all that time pre-financial crisis, managing what was then the rule book going on post-financial crisis to what became our, our regulatory regime and sort of political impetus behind it. I mean, it completely dovetails with what John was saying. You know, we so sort of the, the financial services industry in many respects lost a huge amount of their ability to, to really push regulatory direction in a, in a certain way. Hopefully, we can now start to get that back on track. However, when you're asking an organization like the LME, would you like to rewrite MIFID? I mean, when you first, when we first, it was just, it was like hell in two and a half thousand pages. 
but we've done it. It's in, it's kind of working all right. And the concept of ripping that to pieces bit by bit and then reinstating something slightly different, but potentially no better is quite a disconcerting thought. So the idea of just tweaking the things that you can see up front as not working is an attractive concept for, for an organization who is, who's, I mean, it's only three, three years since we actually implemented it. Um, Perhaps I can come, come back on that. I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that the new regime will look that different in terms of outcomes from what's already there. Mm. It's just there's an immense amount of detail, which is beyond human recollection, uh, <laughs> that creates an industry in its own right, which I don't think um, serves the purpose of managing risks any better than, than, than having a much higher level system with fewer high-end people focusing on what really matters. And, and I would say... Where we've gone wrong is because we've got the worst of both worlds at the moment. We've got the EU code based on these 19th century legal methods. Then on top of that, in order to avoid making more rules, we've increasingly relied on the principles that were the sort of Ten Commandments that Andrew Large introduced and now 11, that are very opaque. And, um, you know, PPI, you know, billions were paid out for PPI mis-selling on the basis of the principles and treating customers fairly, which in retrospect, all the decisions are defensible, but that's not the point of law. It has to be predictable on our method, the common law method. That's the secret genius, not so secret genius, the common law. So we've lost that. And we're also applying it to approved persons, now senior managers, as they're called. And what it means is you've got a double lock on regulatory decisions. You've got the board who's looking at commercial matters, and then you have the regulators imposing their own views, most of whom have not had any commercial experience and are not risk takers on top of that. And it's not the right way to do it. And it, this all went wrong, in fact, when Monsieur Barnier and other various politicians, but he led it in the EU, after the financial crisis, blamed it on Anglo-Saxon capitalism, blamed it on the way the market was regulated. It was actually an, an, the wrong way to analyze it, whether deliberately or not, I don't know. Uh, perhaps it's a civilian way of, a civil law, lawyer's way of thinking about it. The real reason that, that, that things happened is that the regulators themselves and the central banks were relying on the efficient market hypothesis, whereby the market roots out risky practices. And they assumed, although everyone could see there were things going wrong on that shouldn't be going on, they thought the market could deal with them. It turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, and now there's and the, the missing ingredient was the regulation of systemic risk, which actually the Bank of England was tasked with at the time, in truth. Uh, and, that, and, and so was the ECB every, and the Fed. Everyone got it wrong. Plugging that gap has now been, that's, that's happened. You don't need the code, the legal code, the EU code-based method to do it. And it's hampering London and it's been making it progressively less competitive. And that's the bit to lift off. That blanket needs to be removed. OK, can we, can we move on? You've got an agenda. Yeah. What's next on your agenda? So um, tectonic plates in the Eurozone, I think this is also sort of only partially understood. Um, everyone knows about the doom loop and the economic analysis. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, certainly at a high level. The risk implications of the Eurozone's legal structure, I think, are less well understood. And there are just little things, you know, in the scheme of things, little things that keep happening, which indicates to me that the tectonic plates um, are sort of colliding. And at some point, there's going to be an earthquake. I can't tell you when. And in a way, that's the whole point about it, because people say, well, nothing's happened. You must be wrong. But actually, these are big indicators. Uh, the first is a BIS uh, staff working paper on window dressing, uh, which is um, pretty unprecedented, I think, which uh, explains that larger EU banks uh, have been adjusting year end figures to move into lower GSIB buckets and avoid being character or avoid being characterized as GSIBs at all, obviously leading to lower capital charges. The US. Uh, a U.S. staff paper had um, made the same point about U.S. banks in relation to HFC derivatives in 2020. But the difference in the EU, of course, is the legal structure and the um, uh, anomalies about the split sovereignty between the member states and the ECB system, leaving neither of them sovereign, which in itself creates trillions of risk. So it's sort of a different order from what's gone on in the U.S. and I think needs to be properly understand, at least understood. At least 10 EU banks apparently are in the wrong bucket. The paper suggests that the data should be averaged over a year rather than and the assessment based on, on the average rather than year-end figures. And then very briefly, the other thing that's happened is the introduction of the concept of bad will, which is ingenious in many ways. So when you acquire a company, um, if you pay 120 for something worth 100 uh, on, on, a, on a, um, a tangible book value basis, you, you, the 20 you have to deduct because you can't count that. You're not going to eat it. 
as it were. You've only acquired something worth 100. Well, the logic has been flipped on its head. And what they've done, the ECB have done, is introduce the concept of bad will. So if you pay 20, which is very pertinent to a deal going on at the moment and being discussed in Italy for something worth 100, you can actually add, you can you treat yourself as acquiring 80 in bad will, which you can use, although they do exhort banks not to, to, to use it for um, sustainability of their business model and so on. But of course, it's not something you can realize. It's not a profit that you can, you can't get that money because you're ex hypothesized presumably the main buyer in the market for this asset. Andy Haldane walked, warned about this in a speech in 2011 as a concept and the FT picked that up in March last year. And I think in addition to that, um, you know, the, the cross-border mergers are not happening because there's no common European deposit insurance guarantee scheme. So anyone buying a, um, a member state uh, business in member st another member state becomes exposed to the NPLs and deposit guarantee scheme of the other member state. And there's also the point that each, if you acquire in another member state, you become exposed to the bank or the targets or holdings of riskier government debt in the member state of the acquiree. So all of these things seem to be bubbling up. I think they're sort of not noticed, but they accumulate to me the fact that there is something going on. There are clever people behind this constantly tweaking the rules. I mean, you know, the accounting rules for NPLs themselves are tweaked. So instead of the normal accounting treatment in the EU, that if you've got an NPL that's worth zero, you can unilaterally think and declare yourself as having a 60% chance of being repaid and therefore it's worth 60% of, of par. So all of these things add up to me to the point that there is something very fundamental happening, which is exceedingly problematic and is not uh, being properly factored into public debate. And the UK provides a solution to that going back to Brexit because we're risk managers at heart and that's what the city specialised in. OK, but I mean, we can't be surprised that people game the system. I mean, people in the UK and the common law system uh, game, the, game the system just as, as much as people in, in the Code Napoleon areas. Do we? Well, this is a state sponsored gaming. And the answer that the question then is, OK, well, who's paying the price? And the answer is the entire world, because of the interconnected activities of, of the financial market. Uh, the risk is being borne, borne by savers and investors all over the world. And that risk is not being captured through the Basel rule system. And I, I co-authored a book about this called Managing Euro Risk, um, which sets out all the chapter and verse on all these points of how that risk is effectively offloaded from the euro system into the global market. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't just watch that silently without dealing with it. Uh, the solution is that we in London manage it where the EU meets the global markets, which we were doing within the passporting regime. It's the reason they should now do an enhanced equivalence deal with us so that we continue managing this risk for the benefit of everyone else in the world. Where the only people who even spotted it and let alone been dealing with it. John, John and Chris, Christina, do you do, do either of you have any any views on this? I mean, John, you you know, we uh, the the BIS report does su uh, suggest that complexity is always going to be gamed. I take uh, Barney's point that it can be offloaded into the broader financial system. Uh, as for malwill, goodwill, and malwill, um, this has also been around for a while. Do either of you have any thoughts on that? I don't. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one, well, two, two thoughts really uh, quickly, Andrew. One, one is that uh, yes, these things are complex, and they will be gamed by complex and smart people. Um, and where we have that going on, it, it, it is a problem because you know these complex and smart people are spending their time doing that rather than doing stuff which actually benefits genuine economic growth. And you know, the example that always strikes me is you know, how much of the revenues of the, the big four accounting firms uh, are earned advising financial institutions on how to play regulation and deal with regulators, as opposed to using their sort of broader networks to help businesses out there, you know, outside the city of London, outside the financial services sector to actually grow. They could be providing a lot more useful and practical advice, which creates jobs and growth. So that, that I think, would be one observation of it. The, um, the second one really is, is, is about a, another tectonic plate, if I can borrow Barney's uh, expression, which is, you know, this huge capital market arbitrage, which seems to exist at the moment between Europe slash the UK and the US, and which operates in favour of US capital markets funding acquirers, particularly. Uh, private equity acquirers, and you know that is the way capital markets work, and money flows to to where it is best deployed. But it's not a trend that can go on forever, and it's not a trend that is necessarily good 
for growing new vibrant industries in the UK. And I think that's why things like changes to the listing rules, removal of some of the most burdensome regulations here to enable capital markets to operate on an even footing is absolutely crucial. So why, I mean, let me ask Barney, why are uh, PE companies just looking at the UK as being it's, it, you know, it's, it's the lunch that they're about to eat? I mean, I read all the time that um, private equity groups are looking for more and more and more investments in the UK. What are, is this? A, is this good for the UK, or are we doing something that's uh, that's really quite dangerous for ourselves? Well, there are pros and cons. I mean, obviously, capital coming into the UK is generally a good thing, uh, so long as it dividends going out is a bad thing. Yes, and, and so long as the capital's deployed here, the jobs are created here, and so on, and they're not asset stripped. <laughs> Um, I mean, there are rules in AIFMD, an inherited EU law for that reason, that, 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 um, that um, prevent some elements of uh, asset stripping um, for at least two years after, after an acquisition. But I think, I mean, I think it reflects a number of things. I think sterling's undervalued, personally, um, on its long-term trend. I think, um, you know, so sentiment has been too negative in the, in the UK, which means lots of assets here are very cheap. Um, I think there are other reasons. Also to do with the fact that uh, the, the inefficiencies of our listing market, I think we need to up, upgrade. I think Lord Hill's report was a very, very timely and important contribution. I think we should do pretty much all of the stuff he recommends there. Uh, because I think once the public market, I mean, the prospectus regime, the disclosure regime is too expensive, too onerous. Some of the rules around this uh, are too onerous, and therefore it's cheaper for people to come in through different method means to buy an asset and they actually get sufficient clarity on what they're buying through their other methods. And, and you don't need, uh, unfortunately, there isn't enough of a benefit from being in the public market. market. Continue with your agenda. So another topic, I think, so another recent topic that's sort of um, cropped up and I think is a wider ramifications is the UK FCA, PRA and Bank of England published in July a discussion paper on diversity and inclusion in the financial sector. Now, obviously, those are key things to get right and uh, vital um, uh, points in their own right. I'm a little bit troubled by the, why the, by the way this is becoming a regulatory point. And in a way, it's similar to, in my mind to the whole drive towards the ESG and how it's been done. And whether and, and there's a question in my mind about whether we're going too far in some of our thinking. And this is only a discussion paper, I should say. But the regulators are aiming to develop policy rules and guidance that set clear minimum expectations. They're prepared to use their powers. They reverse they refer to diversity as diversity of thought, cognitive diversity, so different perspectives, abilities, knowledge, attitudes, information styles, and demographic characteristics, and inclusion as providing equal access to opportunities and resources. And, and there's no argument with those points, obviously. And, and, and but I do wonder whether legal they should be general legal points in the country rather than regulatory points. And so the sort of things they're considering is setting um, uh, targets for representation at board level. Introducing senior management accountability for DNI, linking remuneration to DNI metrics, DNI reporting obligations, and I mentioned already how you know many regulated firms already are under a very um, heavy regulatory burden. We don't have senior managers as a regime anywhere else in the world, and so we've got a, you know got a regulation of the firm itself and a regulation of individuals, and people are worried that if they do certain things or take a particular line, whether it's a judgment call to be made, but the regulator will take a different view and you can find you can't get another job. I just think, I just wonder whether making this a matter of regulation against the backdrop of this hugely discretionary approach and panoply is actually going to be counterproductive in the industry. They're also looking at setting expectations on product governments and considering how a firm's proposed appointment would contribute to diversity. I mean, as I say, I don't argue at all. In fact, I'm very supportive of the general um, thrust and direction of travel. I just don't know that this is a matter of regulation any more than I'm convinced that the uh, environmental um, uh, elements of ESG is a matter for regulation in the way it's being addressed, because it's hugely political. It's also a proxy for energy pricing. And it's not just an on-off switch, oh, this is environmentally friendly and that isn't. I mean, lots of environmental investments are not particularly attractive. Uh, they're being subsidized. Um, and they're, you know, they're also massaged. What is or isn't in the taxonomy is being massaged to deal with the realities of coal production, Nord Stream 2, all sorts of geopolitical things, which are nothing to do uh, with the abstract um, values being espoused. So I just think regulation should focus on financial risk. 
And I'm concerned that we're getting into something where it's much messier and different people can take different views. I concede that this is a this is a, a minefield, and Kirsten and uh, uh, Christina and John would, I assume, tread carefully in it. Uh, <laughs> cognitive diversity, I find that really fascinating. I don't want stupid people running very big institutions. Uh, but uh, Christina, just give me your thoughts on that. I mean, uh, taking the two in turn. I mean, the the the. The, the ESG concept is, is an interesting one. I mean, the LME has done a lot recently. We've adapted, for instance, uh, you know, anyone requiring uh, or wanting to list a new brand on the exchange now needs to demonstrate that they have sourced that brand responsibly. Um, that is not being driven by, you know, by a piece of regulation. That is being driven by it's the right thing to do. And as a result, we can see the direction of travel from a, from a market's perspective um to, to to you know we have a solution at our disposal we are going to use it um the diversity and inclusion question is probably a little bit more complex um you can feel an almost frustration to why this is being proposed from a regulatory perspective you know the the the, the lack of forward momentum perhaps they feel it's the only alternative um you know again a number of these things do have the potential to have a very um, negative sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, tail to it or um, unintended consequences. It, you have to tread incredibly carefully. Um, I mean, from a personal perspective, you know, concepts of, of, of quotas from a gender perspective have always been a very difficult one for me to get my head around. Um, I, I can see arguments in both, uh, both, both sides. And again, no one is arguing with the concepts. It's just how would you do this in a safe way that benefits those you are looking to benefit? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, again, no, no argument with the concepts. Um, I think what ultimately drives success, whether it's about uh, ESG or, or about uh, diversity and inclusion, is, is not so much what is regulated, but what is actually done. And you know, the really smart thing for companies and, and actors in the financial system to do uh, is to get ahead of the regulation here. The regulators, of course, have to be seen to be doing something and they have to have a backstop. Um, but can firms uh, do something quicker and better than what the regulators are going to make them do? And I think the way to get that done is to align the commercial success with the broader policy objective. I mean, ESG funds, uh, you can certainly make a strong case that they outperform non-ESG funds and have done for a few years. Um, can you do the same thing with companies that have greater diversity? I suspect you can. So make the economic argument and then the regulation only exists as a, as a, as a backstop. Because I do agree that if you have a, a regulatory culture which turns into a sort of box ticking culture, then that doesn't generate the right sort of change that we that we need in the in the industry. And it's most unlikely that we're going to move back from uh, creeping regulation in this area, isn't it? I mean, it, are you just sort of um, shouting into the wind in this one, Barney? It's, it's I'm not. I, I'm not shouting, and I'm not. I, I, I don't. I, my only point. I, I think. I mean, this, these are topics that are fundamental and need addressing. There's no question. I'm just a little bit concerned about the financial regulators getting involved in um, proactive interventions. I, I agree there needs to be you know, there needs to be minimum standards. We need the market to be incentivized to push things in the right direction and, and so on. So I, I, I agree with all of that. I just think um, when their job is um, minimizing or managing financial risk, I think adding to it things which don't necessarily coincide with that um, and ending up with people being empowered in a way it's my, part of my general thesis on senior managers regime and some of the regulatory principles being empowered to impose their own judgments on people on the market uh, rather than actually to have standards which are enforced by the courts by law that go beyond the financial services regulatory framework and the societal which is I think what we're really talking about I prefer the latter societal and legal generally, not something through financial regulation, which I just think is 
should be a discipline focused on a very big mischief, which we saw if that I just taken on, off that ball as in 2007-8, you know, the consequences are dire. And I just think it's, you know, muddying these concepts is, is dangerous. And can I ask you whether you feel that this is something that threatens the competitiveness of the UK vis-a-vis -vis its um, particularly Asian competitors? No, I think, I, no, no, no. I, I think that, um, you know, diverse businesses, diverse thought processes and so on, you know, avoiding group think, I think there are all sorts of benefits to that. And, and, and I don't think it, it, it's an economic harm at all. And it's a question of how it's implemented and um, whether it's done objectively and whether the incentives are there. And I, I, I agree with John's point that it should be more, ideally, if we can create it market-driven principally, and also if there's legislation, it should be across society, not, as I say, through financial regulation, where the job of the regulator is something else. I think we're sort of fixing problems, but we're doing it in a way that can distract people from the job that at hand and that introduces risk. That's what I'm worried about. I don't think that it's a point about Asia or anywhere else. I think we should do this anyway. Okay. But not this way, not in this way. Next on, next on your little list. So um, Artregos, um, capital management, which collapsed in March this year. Um, there were losses, of course, across the market, a number of big names involved in that. Uh, Credit Suisse suffered a loss of approximately five billion, and they did a, a very impressive thing. The board committee reviewed the business and commissioned a law firm, Paul Weiss, to produce a report, a very sophisticated report, produced very quickly, uh, which recommended some remedial actions, which um, uh, have been taken. I think the interesting point out of all of that, because the Paul Weiss report sort of delves into the way risk as a, as, a, as a system works within an institution. Um, I think the overlap between risk, legal and compliance is an ongoing topic to be thought about. I don't think it's a problem in the topic. I think it's just a very um, uh, complex area. Uh, I mean, in that particular case, um, you know, there's, there's some, some individual things around how the risk process was, was managed that, that perhaps contributed to the situation that had been fixed. But I think the interesting thing is, I mean, there is a wider trend. Um, Citibank have been asked to put compliance under legal. Uh, some other banks, uh, another big main major multi bulge bracket bank already has compliance under legal. Um, I think, you know, compliance is a form of law. And to my sort of thesis, the fact to look at it, compliance is a form of law and needs to be using re legal reasoning ultimately and engaging with the regulators on the basis of that reasoning. The regulators need to use legal reasoning and then the two together gives you predictability. So everyone's talking a language of, of, okay, what does this mean? Can you apply it legitimately like that? And you don't do more than is being asked. Um, and that people draft rules asking for what is actually necessary rather than anything extra for the sake of it. And then risk, needs to fit in with that as an equal and there needs to be a sort of constant dialogue between these disciplines and also with the business to pull the whole thing up safely where the firms can then be competitive but under a predictable regime. So I think that matrix is a, very, is a fascinating thing and the Paul Weiss report was an interesting window into some of the issues that are rising. Okay, well, that, that's very much your 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 area, Christina. I mean, risk, legal and compliance. I mean, to put... Yeah. Uh, to put Compliance under legal? Uh, yeah, the, the holy trinity, as they, uh, they don't, all the, there's lots of other words that you should describe risk and compliance. <laughs> um, I, do you know, I think that there are so many different ways of, of managing those three disciplines, and every single firm does it slightly differently. Some do it better than others. Uh, some would argue they do it better than others. Um, at, the LME, we segregate them. So there is a risk function, there is a compliance and regulation function, and there is a legal function, and there is a huge amount of crossover. So risk and compliance are second line functions. In many respects, regulatory compliance is a subset of, of risk management. It, you know, we would argue in terms of how we how we oversee the, the controls that we have in place. The, the actual, you know, ensuring that the first line understands their second line responsibilities and ensuring that we also work with legal that, to make sure we've interpreted 
the, the sort of the rules appropriately because we have different types of rules and they're drafted differently. You've got your your legislation, but you've also got for us it's 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 rec. You know, rec sort of de determines everything that we do as an exchange, um, and ensuring that we have got. You use the word consistency is important and it's difficult because we don't always look at things the same way as the regulator. So you know, to have a degree of certainty would go an awfully long way. And I think it would help to alleviate those instances where perhaps, you know, we would think, right, well, this is compliant. And then a, a regulator will come and say, well, we don't think that is compliant for the following reasons, because you've read it differently. Um, it, it, it does create a, an ongoing challenge. Is there, a, is there a single single way to, to, to handle this, uh, John? I mean, I mean, clearly Barney feels as as one would expect him to do. Uh, legal is the master science, and we all, we all report to legal in the end. <laughs> I, I think it's a slightly theological debate, actually, <laughs> which of the three uh, has primacy, and and you know how, how you bolt them together in different ways. Uh, and I suspect uh, Christine is absolutely right that different firms will do it in different ways, partly depending on what works for them and on, on the history that, that they have. Um, I think the, 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 the bigger point in some ways is that the three of them collectively are sufficiently empowered in their dealings with the rest of the business because very, very often in the past, financial crises have come about because um, the p &L side of the business, the people trying to do the transactions, have been able to ride pretty much roughshod over risk compliance and occasionally legal. So it's how do you have a governance structure which uh, creates the right balance of powers between you know, the, the, the P&L commercial side of the business and the sort of very broadly defined risk uh, part of the business uh, so that you, you, you get more things right than you get wrong because that's how you survive. So I think that that's almost more important than, you know, whose desk is nearer the window. Mm -hmm. Bonnie? <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. I, 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 but I think it's something that we should keep talking about and keep thinking about within the industry because um, there, there are a lot of um, subtleties here about the, the, the functions. And I think it's linked to the golden key or the silver key or whatever. It's going to unlock the biggest upside to having our own rulemaking powers after Brexit and being able to go back to the common law method. Because uh, if we're able to get it so that the those business functions together are able to interact with the business with confidence and the, as to what's being required from the regulators, um, that'll unleash and, and and we're able also to lift some of the senior manager restrictions that allow the more commercial decision making, relying more on the market, I suppose, is a fundamental theme of all of what we're um, raising, uh, then I think we'll get much more growth uh, and innovation, and, uh, but, but safely. I don't, I don't think it needs to be risky, but I think the secret is, is in these back office linking, linkages. I, I wanted to come back. You, you've mentioned the senior managers regime several times, and clearly this is something that bothers you. Just, can you just tell us why, what, where you see the main shortcomings in that particular regime are? Yes. Um, so in the States, they don't have it, and, and elsewhere they don't have it. In the States, when things go wrong, and you, I just mentioned Archer Goss, the board is heavily overseen by the regulators and then has its own advice and commissions its own analysis and decides what to do independently and is, is a serious body. Um, but the individuals themselves are not regulated. Um, what we've done is we've got a number of board members who've got their own regulatory obligations with their own one-on-ones with the regulator, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. Then we've got a number of senior executives um, who have their own regulatory obligations and their own one-on-one -on -one meetings with things being cross-checked. They will so and so said it, put it this way, you don't seem to think alike and so on. And there is a big um, risk factor, which is that the regulations are being applied the same standard as they are to the firm. The way I think it should work is that they should be a minimum, uh, there should be a, a minimum bar to being admitted. And, and that was how the senior managers regime worked. 
the bar arguably was too low then. It was basically whether people had committed an offence or so. Uh, and obviously that's too, I mean, I can see that's too low, but but it should be a minimum bar. Is someone sufficiently qualified to be in the job they're in? And the burden of proof on the way in should be on the firm and them to show that they are. If they're then challenged, it seems to me the burden of proof should be on the regulator uh, to say, no, 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 they've, they've not, they're no longer meeting this minimum bar. Above that bar, I think it should be a commercial matter. And, and ultimately, the, where we, I think, have gone wrong, and we've gone way too far in, in our regulatory approach, and it's partly because of the inherited EU code-based system, partly because of our own doing through the principles-based approach and through senior managers, is we have this sort of chilling effect of regulators wanting to ensure that there's never a position where they can't say, no, no, no I told you you can't do that. So, in, but unfortunately, I think the only safe way is to put the upfront effort into defining things more specifically, not rely on these principles, not enforce on the basis of principles alone, unless there's case law to explain how they should be interpreted and applied to a situation uh, or guidance or specific examples. And it should be a minimum threshold and you rely much more on the commercial. I think we got way, way too far off the financial crisis by misdiagnosing that, that, that it had arisen through the efficient market hypothesis rather than because the market itself is evil. And we're now regulating the market in the in a way of a sort of bad child, a problem child that needs to be told what to do each step of the way and get thwacked if if someone says, no, I disagree, you shouldn't have, you should have had a better head of risk. I think you could have, I've heard this, I think you could have done better on your, your CFO proposal. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure it's for a, a regulator, normally quite a junior regulator, who's had no commercial experience to make that judgment call. That should be for the board. Do either of you, Castino, John, have a, a thought on that? You're both presumably subject to all these regimes. John? Well, I, I think only really that it slightly loops back to the issue that I mentioned before, which is about private equity versus publicly listed companies, uh, possibly about financial services, regulated companies versus companies in other sectors. You know, you've got to be quite careful not to make regulated positions in FS companies so uncomfortable for the people who occupy them that they feel the grass is greener elsewhere where they're you know, not under such constant complex supervision. Hmm. Christina? Yeah, it's, I mean, it is an, and the two, so we are actually not, um, uh, as an exchange, we are not subject to um, the SMR or SMCR regime. Hmm. Um, but we, we have implemented it for the purposes of making things simpler for the regulator to understand, which sounds a bit ironic to take on board additional regulatory complexity without being mandated to because some of the concepts contained within the SMR to our point, to our mind made sense. It was an easy way of encapsulating the responsibilities that sat with the individual and, and how exactly they discharged their responsibilities to their respective individuals. Um, it all dovetailed back to that same point on, you know, what is the financial regulators um, remit in terms of managing culture Mm -hmm. um, because of this concept of, you know, the subjugation of, of, of risk compliance and to a degree legal colleagues, when there have been issues, the, the sort of the concept is born that you almost need to promote basic cultural and ethical concepts within those organizations. SNCR is one way of doing it. Um, there are others. Um, it, it does create various layers of complexity because as soon as you put someone or you give somebody personal liability or a business decision when there are a number of 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 of, of things to consider including commercial aims because unless you're a, a social utility it, it you really are you know you do have to balance the two um, and every single discussion will be what is the lowest possible risk i can take to protect myself um, and, you know, whether that is the right question to be asked. Yeah, a regulatory mandate to, to regulate culture. So sort of very dangerous, dangerous direction of, of travel. But look, we've run out of time. What should we be worrying about over the next month? First of all, Barney, what are you worrying about over the next month? 
I'm keeping an eye on GDPR and the reforms uh, and the way that the thinking is going to evolve on that. I think it's a big reason that we haven't got big data innovation in the UK. And I think the opportunity arises for us to be able to do that. But I think we need quite profound, uh, a profound rethink of how we address data. Yeah, I mean, the, I, the FT's big read today, I think, is on the, data, the use of data in China. It's uh, quite terrifying. Um, can, let me ask uh, Christina first, next. Christina, what are you worrying about over the next month? I mean, I, I think we're we're trying to make sure that we've put enough thought into the the various reviews that the government is putting out at the moment. GDPR is a big one for us as well. Um, even as a non-holder of personal information of any magnitude, it is a hugely ugly piece of legislation we're trying to manage. Um, yeah. Are you optimistic that we can? Uh, re I, I really am. I genuinely do think we are going. The discussions that we're having with policymakers, Treasury, uh, and the regulators are positive. I feel like we are being listened to. We are having an open discussion. We're talking about what would work best. You know, for us as a sort of global center for metals, very specific market. It's a good conversation. Um, and I am I am genuinely positive about the direction of travel. John, what are you worried about? I mean, I, I think on the retail finance side and, and regulatory change, um, I think we do need to think quite carefully about this concept of consumer duties and exactly what form that takes, how hard it is, and whether it opens up a, a subsequent sort of floodgate of vexatious litigation driven by claims management companies. So and it's not to say consumer rights aren't important because they massively are, but let's not um, allow them to be abused perhaps 10 or 20 years down the line. Uh, on, on the institutional side, uh, I think one of the things to, to keep an eye on is that global markets continue to operate to global norms, uh, and that includes things like the delegation of asset management. If we fragment in Europe into a uh, sort of drive to, to hold all components of asset management in different financial uh, country capitals, uh, then the only ultimate winners really will be uh, New York and Shanghai. And uh, we've got to look after ourselves by supporting these global norms, which took a long time to establish. On that note, can I thank... Uh, can I thank Christina? Can I thank John? Can I thank Barney? And of course, can I thank all of you for watching? See you again, I hope, next month.